Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Pastor Fields here. And this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I give God all the glory. He's been good to me. I praise him. I give him all of the honor. Had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, I don't know where I'd be today. I'm sure you feel the same way. The Lord has blessed us to come together one more time. Another Bible study, another opportunity to get into God's word, to learn, to share, to be ministered to, to take away nuggets and certainly to take what we learn and apply it to our lives. Hide that word in our hearts that we may not sin against our God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. And we do thank you for all that you've done, your goodness, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for allowing us to come together today, to worship together today, to go into your word today. Bless us one by one, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Always a joy to come to you and people of God here at Greater Refuge Temple in Washington, D.C., and the Saints of God uh, in the Bronx at Refuge Temple Annex, and all of you who are connecting with us today from different parts of the country and even the world, uh, I thank God for you. Now, uh, we have been in a series, seven-part series. We're in part six today. Um, dealing with the seven churches of Asia Minor. In the book of Revelation, our theme has been a letter from Jesus. Uh, and we started, of course, in Ephesus, then to Smyrna, then the Pergamos, then the Thyatira. Last week, we were in a place called Sardis. Uh, and today, we're with the Church of Philadelphia. Um, seven churches. John, that apostle uh, that loved the Lord and was loved of the Lord, uh, he's the last one left, and he is on the Isle of Patmos. He has been exiled. He has been punished because he w would not stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's an old man now, uh, and the Lord has brought him to a place where before he leaves the earth, uh, he wants to show him some things, some things to come, uh, some things that had already happened, uh, but certainly the future, uh, future blessings, future judgment. And John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And the Lord showed him many things uh, he writes letters. He starts out the book of Revelation by writing letters to his church. It's a mail route uh, here in Asia Minor. If you looked at a map today, it would be Turkey or Western Turkey. Uh, and today we are in Philadelphia. Uh, and remember, a quick rehash, that each church uh, represents a certain era, E-R-A, of church history, what was going on uh, during this time. And of course, different theologians and Bible scholars may differ with, uh, as it relates to the time frame, but many believe that it, uh, it represents an era, uh, a time in history, uh, what the church was going through, what the church had become, uh, it shows how far the church had deviated from the original model. So many things were added on, so much dilution. And there, went, there were not many who were holding on to the true word of God. Uh, there were not many who were not mixing it with other religions and other forms of worship. Um, so here we are, the Lord is writing letters to his churches uh, letting them know what they needed to do, what they needed to correct. We're in the book of Revelation chapter 3 in Philadelphia, verses 7 through 13. 
I'm going to read, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, the angel of the church, to the pastor of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown, him that overcometh. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Praise God. Now, in contrast to the other churches that we've talked about in this series, Philadelphia was not uh, considered a wealthy or sophisticated or influential city. Uh, it was located um, on an easily defended hill beside a major highway. It functioned as an outpost back then for spreading Greek and Roman culture. Uh, later on, it would be responsible for spreading Christianity and many theologians and historians feel that uh, it is here, this platform in Philadelphia, because of their missionary work, is responsible for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in the country of India. Um, but that's another story, but one day I'm sure we'll get there. Um, Philadelphia was a city that was destroyed several times by earthquakes. Uh, but it's good to know that each time the city was destroyed, it was rebuilt. Uh, so it's a resourceful, uh, strong, resilient people uh, that lived in Philadelphia, uh, and it still exists to this day. And we know that Philadelphia means brotherly love. Uh, now, we talked about errors, each church representing errors. And the Philadelphia era uh, appears to have begun in the 1930s, uh, about the time radio became popular, just before the age of, of television. Uh, I'm telling my age, but when I... When I grew up as a young, young fella, I, I can remember the transition between black and white TV uh, and color TV. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the last, um, I'd say in the last 75 to 80 years, the church, uh, the church has been using mass media, radio, television um, for ministry. Now... Uh, of course, is social media, but during this time, uh, radio and um, and television. Uh, I remember many televangelists uh, coming uh, into, uh, you know, being very, very present in my life, listening to different ministries on uh, the radio, um, and it's reached millions of people. Millions of people have been reached with the word of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached. The coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, warnings uh, concerning watching for the signs of the end times. All of this has been broadcast and continues to be broadcast. Uh, and certainly this is the mission uh, that Jesus gave to the church, right? Uh, Matthew 4 and 23. 
Let's read it. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of diseases or sickness and all manners of disease among the people. Uh, if we go to Matthew 10, 6 and 7, uh, this is Jesus talking now, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now this, this message was prevalent at the end of the age. Uh, it was prominent, I should say, at the end of the age. Uh, if I take you to Matthew 24 and 14, uh, it says, and this is Jesus talking again, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, here we are in 2022, uh, and the word of Jesus, uh, the word of God will not hit the ground. He says, uh, for when this gospel is preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, I don't know how you feel about what I just read, but to me it means that there's somebody in this world that hasn't heard that Jesus saves yet. Uh, somebody in the bush, somewhere in the mountains, uh, somewhere in the valley, or somewhere uh, in some deserted island that has not heard that Jesus uh, saves. Uh, but when we've all heard it, when we've all been given an opportunity to decide Will you accept him or reject him? He says, then shall the end come. My God. So um, this is the second church. I want you to know uh, the first one was Smyrna, but Philadelphia would be the second church uh, that received no condemning words. Uh, and I would say it's because they turned back to the word of God. Uh, they continued in the word of God. And, and uh, perhaps you might feel that the word turn, the phrase turn back is too harsh. Uh, but every church has a challenge. And, and here's why I said that. Even today, every church has a challenge. Am I going to seek to be popular, uh, pleasing to the world? Uh, am I going to give the word of God as it is, or am I going to mix this with that? So we all, every preacher, every angel of the church has the same challenge where we have to make a decision uh, because everybody's not going to like it. Uh, should I preach against that? Uh, and the answer is yes. If the Bible speaks against it, then uh, listen, whatever God says is wrong is wrong. Whatever God says is sin is sin. All right, whatever God says is right is right. So our singing, the song we sing, the sermon we preach, the lessons we teach should all coincide with the will, the word of God. Uh, so God promises to provide uh, the Philadelphia era with an open door, an open door, a door that no man uh, can shut. Nobody can shut it. Uh, an open door. This is the Lord speaking. I'm going to set before you an open door. Now, you know, when the door opens uh, and when God opens a door, that means we're supposed to step through it. Uh, yeah. So the question, every, and every time I, I read this particular passage of Scripture, the question, of course, uh, will always come whether I know the answer or not. Uh, what is the door opening for? Uh, because he says there's a door. When I open the door, no man can shut it, right? So that door uh, is for preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel. I'm going to open doors. And there's someone listening to me uh, right now. He says, I set before you an open door and no man can shut it. No man. Now, you know, when people open doors for you, uh, that's called opportunity. Uh, if they get mad at you, they'll shut that door. Uh, or if you don't do what they say, if you, you know, if you don't look the way they want you to look, they can shut that door. But God says, 
I'm going to open this door and no man, I don't care who he is, I don't care if they don't like what you say, if I open the door, no man can shut it. So it's a small church and God commands, or he commends, I should say, this, this small congregation for its persistence in fulfilling its mission and for holding on without compromise. Holding on, and that's the key today in the challenge, especially hold on without compromise. They were persistent, uh, persistent in holding on to the truth. Let's read Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth, and no man can shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. That's powerful commendation. I know your struggle, but you have not denied my name. They were faithfully doing the work and holding on to the truth. They weren't just going to church, uh, not just attending a church of their choice, right? But these Philadelphian uh, believers are promised uh, protection, protection from the coming tribulation, my Lord. And here, here goes that argument because there are some of our brothers and sisters that believe that the church is going to go through tribulation period. Uh, and he promised these, these Philadelphian believers, because you've held on to my truth, because you've endured, he that endures to the end shall be saved. Uh, I'm going to protect you from the coming tribulation. Uh, Revelation 3 and 10, because you have kept the word of my patience. Mm-hmm. Patience of the Lord is salvation, prophecy. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So here, even in the beginning of the lesson, the lesson uh, of the Philadelphian uh, discourse between Jesus uh, and the angel of this church uh, is simple. Remain faithful. Stay faithful. Remain faithful. Put that in the comment section. Remain faithful. Don't don't switch up all of a sudden. You know what I've noticed in growing older uh, and being in the church all these years. Uh, all of a sudden, you you'll have people that have been in church for years, preaching and teaching the truth for years. And one day it seems like they get up and decide, I'm not going to preach the truth anymore. I'm not going to live the truth anymore. They just walk away from it. Uh, but this church was being commended for being faithful. Here's the lesson. Remain faithful to truth, to truth, and do the work of preaching and teaching the gospel. Love the brethren. Mm-hmm. And don't let anyone take your crown. All of that is in there. Don't let anybody take your crown. Keep you from receiving your reward. Don't throw away your confidence, the Hebrew writer says, because it has great recompense of reward. We can't afford to drop the ball. No, especially because of where we are now. These are the last days. My brother, my sister, we can't afford to drop the ball. We can't afford to walk away from the truth now. No, hold on. You can't afford to drop the ball. Uh, no, this is a vital moment in history. We're almost at the finish line. Hallelujah. I felt the Holy Ghost. Our salvation and our reward are at stake. If I stop preaching the truth, my reward is at stake. My soul is at stake. God is not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie. Why should I start preaching lies? It's the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's, let's dig a little deeper. Um, Revelation 3 and 7, let's go back there to the angel of the church, to the pastor 
of the Philadelphian church, I'm writing to you, I'm holy, I'm true. I have the key of David. I'm the one that opens and no man shuts. I shut and no man opens. This is the Lord speaking. So I have in my notes, Philadelphia, they, they, there's a danger of failing in advance. Um, and I made that blanket statement uh, because again, it, it represents an era. Um, now I mentioned the 1930s, there are other commentators uh, that say that it represents uh, the 17, 9, 1790 up through the 19, early 1900s. Um, it was a missionary church. Uh, and again, this is the time where the gospel of Jesus Christ was spreading uh, from here into parts of India. So uh, to give you a juxtaposition of where Philadelphia was from Sardis, uh, 25 miles southeast from Sardis. Uh, and when you, when you travel that way uh, geographically, uh, if, if you looked further southeast, you would be able to see uh, at least the opening uh, or the door uh, because it was a mountainous area. You'd, you'd go down southeast, but you would look at, and there'd be like an 800-foot rise. So you would have to look up uh, into the rise, uh, mountainous region on both sides. So it literally geographically looked like there was a, a door made there, a pathway made there. Uh, and the Lord says, you all, listen, remember what I read, you all have a little strength, a little strength. Uh, but here God comes to these people who have a little strength and says, I'm going to make an opportunity for you. Hallelujah. I'm going to make an opportunity with you. I'm going to open a door for you. And he says, and if I open this door for you, not even the gates of hell, can shut it. No man can shut it. And he reminds them, says, I have the key of David, which means I have the authority. No one can give you opportunity but God. No one can open the door but God. I don't care how popular you feel that you are. If God didn't open the door, uh, the door would be shut. It's a supernatural door, of course. I, I have the keys of David in my hand. Uh, and he makes reference to those who say that they are Jews and they are not. Mm -hmm. Now, this refers uh, to those who claimed, um, of course, and, and I'm, my mind is racing again, but literally it, he's referring to those who have rejected the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. Um, let's go to Romans chapter 2 verses 28 through 29 for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of of God. Mao. I'm going to read that same verse in the Common English Bible. Listen to how it sounds. It isn't the Jew who maintains outward appearances who will receive praise from God. And it isn't people who are outwardly circumcised on their bodies. Remember, circumcision was a form of purification. Uh, this is one reason why in the book of Acts you see there's a little uh, argument or debate uh, because the Gentiles now are receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Paul gets into it uh, with the council because they now are saying, well, if you really want to be a, a part of us, if you really want to be up in the body of Christ, um, you have to be circumcised. Could you imagine? Grown, these were some were grown men. And uh, could you imagine even today having an altar call 
uh, and somebody standing at the altar and says, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. And the preacher pulls a knife out and says, before I baptize you, I got to circumcise you. Now that's how foolish, that's how foolish the conversation sounds, but they were serious. You got to be circumcised. And they were Jews because I'm circumcised. I'm better than you. I'm cleaner. Uh, and Paul is letting them know it's it's you circumcised on the outside, but there's something still wrong on the inside. Something is wrong with your heart. So he says, um, and it isn't people who are outwardly circumcised on their bodies. Instead, it is the person who is a Jew inside, who is circumcised in the spirit, not literally. So that person's praise person's praise doesn't come from people but from God didn't the Lord say man looks on the outside but out of the appearance but God is looking on the inside and another uh, passage or another translation would say it like this uh, where uh, it says that person's praise doesn't come from people but from God there's another translation that says recognition comes from God, not legalistic critics. <laughs> My God, that's, a, that's another lesson within itself. My God. So he says, I know those who are saying they're Jews and they're not. Jews and they're not. And I hear the Lord even saying to today's church, I know those who are saying they're saved and are not. I know I'm looking at their hearts, right? Um, He's not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So the Lord is talking. The Lord is talking. And he shows himself to this small congregation. He says, I know that you have a little strength. Uh, but he says... Uh, I am holy. Yes, I am. Jesus tells us to be holy even as he is holy. Let's go there. Leviticus eleven forty four. I am the Lord thy God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves and ye shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Uh, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And when you see that word conversation uh, in the word of God, many times it means behavior, your behavior. But as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of behavior. Uh, and he shows himself. Uh, to the church in Philadelphia as being holy, uh, as being truth. Uh, didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? You don't believe me, I'll read it. St. John 14 and 6. This is the Lord Jesus talking. And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. My God, I love God's word. So he's letting them know I'm the one that opens the door. Jesus is the one that opens the door. Uh, he, has, he has the keys. He has the key. He has the key. He's the one that opens the door to heaven or hell. <laughs> Jesus is the door to heaven. He's the only one who can shut or open either door. He took the keys of hell. Yes, he did. He took the keys of hell away from the devil. Hallelujah. And when Jesus went there and preached for three days, remember? Uh, Peter even talks about it. He went in, down into hell and preached for three days to the souls that were being held captive. Uh, and on that third day when he was ready to go, one writer says he spoiled principalities. I'd, I'd like to say he punched them in the mouth and took the keys out of the enemy's hands. He's got the keys to heaven and hell. Took the keys away. 
went down and he preached Jesus as the final judge for everyone's resting place. The final judge for everyone's resting place from A to Z. Listen, God is so much in control and never think that people are getting away, away with their sins and their abominations and being so diabolical. Never think that people who have done such wickedness are going to get away. Jesus is the final judge of everyone's resting place, where they're going to spend eternity. I've got the keys of David in my hand. I've got all authority. And when he got up from the grave, remember, he said, I've got all power in my hand. So this church here in Philadelphia, uh, it's a symbolic church today, of course. Uh, it's symbolic, not only well aware of whom Jesus is, but they are patterning their lives after the life of Jesus, showing love, spreading the word. Uh, they are the very elect, full of God's word, so full that it would be terribly difficult to deceive them. Terribly difficult to deceive them. Mm -hmm. God promises, listen to my notes, God promises these believers that he will keep them from the hour of temptation. That's tribulation, which will come upon the entire world. And note the event that he's speaking of. Tribulation period. Uh, there are several things I want to point out. One, it's a definite time period. <laughs> it's a definite time period. It's going to happen. Tribulation is coming. So is the rapture. Make up your mind which one you want to attend, the rapture or tribulation. It's a period of trial. Was future from the time of John's writing. It hadn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. It's going to be worldwide. The promise in the Greek sounds like this. To keep thee out of the hour. I'm going to keep you out of the hour. I'm going to keep you out of tribulation. If I live right, heaven belongs to me. God will keep us out of tribulation. The church will not be in tribulation, not if you're in the church triumphant. So these facts make it evident that the event refers to the tribulation period. The Lord is talking. Matthew, let's go to Matthew 24, verses 15 through 22. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him under stand then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes and woe unto them that are with child and to them which give suck in those days but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the sabbath day but then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, but for the elect's sake, but for the elect's sake, there will be certain people who will make it through. And that's an, uh, another lesson uh, where uh, 12,000 from each tribe will be sealed. Yes, and one of the frustrations that the Antichrist uh, will have was he won't be able to find them, won't be able to touch them. But God said, I'm going to take, I'm going to choose 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of each tribe, 144,000. And yes, there will be those uh, who come out of tribulation, uh, for lack of a phrase, the only form of salvation, uh, we believe uh, you will have to lose your life. You will have to lose your life. The church is gone. The hour of grace has passed, right? Now this is tribulation. And if you don't take the mark of the beast, uh, you'll lose your head. You'll be killed. Now we're under grace. We're under grace. Give your life to the Lord. 
give your life to the Lord, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But during tribulation period, there'll be a portion there. Uh, that those, uh, I'm sure there will be people who are in church for years who are now in tribulation period because they missed the rapture. And just like many others, you'll have to choose, either take the mark of the beast or you lose your life. Now, uh, the pressure here will be you won't be able to travel. You won't be able to sell or buy if you don't have the mark of the beast. Now, some people erroneously are saying that this vaccine uh, that the government uh, and governments all over the world are trying to get us to take uh, because of COVID is the mark of the beast. It is not the mark of the beast. That's another lesson. Uh, it's a vaccine. It's a vaccine. It is not the mark of the beast. If you read your word, it'll either on the forehead or the palms of their hand. It is not the mark of the beast. Uh, now, perhaps these believers at Philadelphia who have only a little strength uh, have nevertheless kept God's word and have not denied his name. God promises them that I will make you pillars in the temple of God. Hallelujah. You look weak now, but I'm going to make you a pillar. I'm going to make you strong. And I want you to remember that my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Revelation 3 and 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall not go no more out. Mm -hmm. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So um, the church might have been small in number or in material resources, but God was going to make them strong. Listen, don't get upset about the size of, of your church. And I know there are people who, who make try to make small churches or our uh, storefront churches feel bad. Well, you don't have this, you don't have that. Listen, if you're preaching the truth, if you're sharing the true gospel of Jesus Christ, don't be. there's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, this was a small congregation and they were promised. Uh, God said, I'm going to make you strong. They are promised an open door. And scripture, an open door refers to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am the way. That's why I said he's the only one that can open the door. Every, every bit of your progress, every bit of your blessing is because of Jesus Christ. John 10 and 7. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So he's talking about this. He's also, remember I said it's a door open to preach the gospel. It's an opportunity to preach the gospel, Acts 5, 19 and 20. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So no matter what, God's going to make a way. He's going to make a way for you to spread the gospel. What a beautiful promise. I know you're small. Your, your strength is is. A small, your small congregation, but I'm going to open the door for you. Many souls are going to hear the word. You're going to be, hallelujah, uh, a segue into many people being blessed, even in another country. An opening, an opening, an opening. And because you're continued in my way, you're going to make the rapture. That's another door, Revelation 4 and 1, because there are a whole lot of folks who have been in church all their life, uh, but when they get to that final door, uh, hallelujah, if God doesn't open it for you, you won't make it in. Remember, uh, remember, uh, there were 10 virgins, five were foolish, five were wise, five had oil in their lamp, but the other five, even though they had a lamp and they trimmed their lamp as though they had oil in it. So there are a whole lot of people trimming their lamps, dressing and looking the part, but they don't have the Holy Ghost on the inside. And the Bible says the end of that story, when they knocked on the door, the door was shut. They had to knock on the door. 
these words ring in my spirit every time I read that particular parable it's, or that story. It says, and the door was shut. And remember, Jesus is telling the Philadelphian church, well, when I open the door, no man can shut it. But if I ever shut a door, no man can open it. So each of these can be interpreted as, a, as an open door. Uh, I'll, I'll give you more access to me. I'll give you more opportunities to preach the word of God and to teach the word of God. And I'll keep the door open for you because you've been faithful. You've held on to my name. You've held on to the truth. When I come for my church, you'll be able to walk through that door too. Hallelujah. So in these these last days, God is opening a whole lot of doors of opportunity for the people of God. There's, there's always, though, uh, an inherent danger to advance at Christ's command. Uh, I should say a danger of failing. Uh, and the danger of failing does not come because of him, but it comes because uh, sometimes we, we cease to be faithful or Sometimes people walk away from the truth. They, they're preaching one thing today, uh, but tomorrow they'll preach something totally different. Um, and there are those who are holding on in the midst of frustration and in the midst of feeling rejected because people are pushing away the truth. Uh, that holiness stuff is, is not for us today. Speaking in tongues, they'll say, is not for us today. Miracles is not for us today, my Lord. How frustrating that is! That you know, there's there is a um, there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken near our house, uh, and every time we had to stop going there because every time we went there, um, there's a young lady there. She likes to use the word "ain't," and we're trying to order food. She said, "We ain't got no. We ain't got no. Can I have some wings? We ain't got no. Can I have some of this? We ain't got no." Um, and and today. For those of us who are teaching and, and preaching the truth, that's how frustrating it is for us uh, because there are others uh, who the doors are open. There's a sign there, but when you get in there, we ain't got no. Where's the holiness? We ain't got no. Uh, well, where, where's, where's the truth of the gospel? We ain't got no. Um, and it's very frustrating uh, to be in the midst of a, a day or midst of a time uh, where even people are preferring to go where they ain't got no uh, and holding on to it as though it's going to get them into heaven. But no, uh, none but the righteous shall see God. And it's the ministry. And I'm not just talking about a, a church congregation, but individually we have to hold on to the truth and be faithful to our God. And doors will open for us. And if God opens it, no man can shut it. And if he ever shuts a door, and listen, there are doors he needs to shut. Hallelujah. But I don't want him to shut any door that is going to keep me from having access to him. So here we are. God said, I'm going to make you strong. I'm going to give you strength. I'll make you a spiritual warrior. Hallelujah. And I want you to continue being faithful. Somebody needs to hear this. Faithful to my word. Faithful to my truth. Um, and let me go back to my original statement because uh, in the midst of all I said, there is a danger of failing if you let go of the truth. Uh, or if you cease to be faithful to God, um, then there'll be some setback, some hold back. So I need to ask a question to someone. It's rhetorical. You don't have to put anything in the comments section. What is it that's holding you back? Uh, why haven't you walked through uh, those doors? Well, uh, there, there could be several reasons. One reason can be fear. Uh, it could be money. Is it money? Lord, I don't have the money, but all the gold and silver belongs to him. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Is it health? Some are not well in their body. He is a healer. And even in spite of how we feel in our body, God is the one that blesses and strengthens. And even there, uh, Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in, uh, therefore to be content. Uh, is it your relationship with others? Uh, the Lord's nevertheless, I hear God say, I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. Uh, I've heard of the saints being sick and in the hospital, and they took that time to witness uh, to those in the hospital, uh, telling the doctors and the nurses they got to be born again, must be saved. Paul, uh, while he was in prison, uh, he told them to their face, I'm not your prisoner. I am the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, uh, four watches, four times a day. The soldiers would alternate and change. Chains around his ankles, chains around his wrist, chains around his waist, soldiers standing on each side of him. And hallelujah, he took time to write letters to the Ephesians, to the Philippian church. Took time to write to Titus and Timothy. He's under he's under arrest. If he makes any false move, kill him. Hallelujah. At any time he could have been killed. But he's looking the soldiers in the face and saying, I'm not your prisoner. And he takes that opportunity to preach the word of God to those who are holding him captive. And because of this, uh, history says many of these soldiers were saved. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in Jesus' name. Uh, so what I'm saying to you. Uh, the Philippian church did not use the smallness of their congregation uh, or the fact that they only had a little strength. God said, I don't want you to use that as an excuse because I am the blesser. I know what I'm doing. I've set before you an open door. No man can shut. All the demons in hell can't shut it. Jesus is the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All we have to do is walk through those doors. Yes. Walk in those doors. Go on. Walk through the door. The power of God will keep you. <clears throat> Kept by the power of God. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Revelation 3 and 8. I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So um, I have a little side note here. Um, this is the church uh, that many feel, and I said it early in the lesson, uh, a church that turned back to the word of God. If, if they had strayed, they, they, they came back to it. Um, I, I sort of differ because God, the Lord is telling them that you have held on. You have you have kept the faith, uh, but it's speculated uh, that this church, the Phil Philadelphian church, lasted longer than any of the seven churches. Um, I would say up until the 13th century, uh, literally, uh, and which means it had a continuous existence. Um, now, according, and, and it's a historical fact that the church was destroyed. The city was ransacked, but the church within itself was destroyed uh, by Seljuk Turks. Now, uh, we've said several times here in Asia Minor, if you looked at a map, it's now part of Western Turkey or the country of Turkey. And Turkey uh, is, is prominently Muslim. Uh, so back here in the 1300s, there was among the Seljuk Turks, uh, a Muslim empire being established and they murdered every believer, every single believer, every single, every single born again believer of this congregation was slaughtered. Uh, they, they fought against Christians. This was during the Crusades, if you remember uh, history, where between Christianity and Islam, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Christianity and, and Islam. 
uh, and these people were wiped out. Even, listen, today in Somalia and other countries, Christians who refuse to denounce Jesus Christ as their Savior are being killed today in the year 2022. Uh, they're being slaughtered. Um, they would not let go of the name. He says to the Philippian church, thou has not uh, given up my name. And there's some, yes, are we in danger of losing our life for not giving up the name? Uh, yeah. Yes, that's, that's, listen, some of the stuff that we complain about today in church, uh, she talked about me, they looked at me funny. Um, that's, that's nothing compared to, to what people are really going through for the cause. There are people who are refusing to give up Jesus and having their heads cut off, losing their lives. I can tell you more atrocities. You wouldn't believe it, but it's happening even today. Jesus is aware of what every church is doing and what all of his people are going through. He has firsthand knowledge. He knows everything. Uh, because he walks in the church, he walks through the church. He stands at the door, he sees everything that we're going through. Not only does he stand at the door, but he is the door. And he has provided himself for us to go through all the way to heaven. The door that Jesus opens, he's the only one that can close it. He cares for his own. He cares for his own. Put it in the comment section, Jesus cares for me. Yes. So I, I want to go back to the little strength comment that the Lord makes. He says that this church has a little strength. This, this, is, this is true of many. We have a little strength. We have weaknesses. Yeah, we have little quirks. Don't, don't you sit there and act like uh, everything is perfect about you. No, we all, every single one of us has little quirks, some things that we need the Lord to work on. Yeah, um, we all have weaknesses, but Jesus is strong. There's a, there's a song that says, I am weak, but he is strong. Yeah, my God. I think that's a, a snippet of just a closer walk with thee. Uh, Jesus has the strength to, to sustain us. He is my substance. Hallelujah. Yeah. Then he says something, though. You may have a little strength, but you've kept my word. You didn't give up. You didn't start making excuses. Hallelujah. So the lesson there, right there, we, we have to learn also to be careful that we guard the word of God. Guard it. Hold on to it. And when we hear something that's not right, be willing to say, that's not the word. No. The Bible is my instruction. It's my book for living. It's my manual. And I won't change it in any way. I won't change it in any way. So this church, again, might have been small in size, uh, but they were big in love. They loved each other. They loved the Holy Ghost. They loved God's word. They loved God's name. And we see many denying his name today, but they would not deny the name, right? Uh, and, and we're living in a day-to-day, -day, right, um, where they want to call Jesus a prophet, a teacher, a healer, a man. Uh, but there aren't a whole lot of folks, even in, in the church, that want to really come to the realization that he's God. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Paul said that Jesus was a visible image of an invisible God. Yes, um, he is the visible image of a visible, of an invisible God. I'm sorry. And this is very important. Um, and I'm, we'll mention it more as we continue in this series. Uh, verse number 9, Revelation 3 and 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but they lie. I'm going to make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee, 
So um, this this is a statement that might that might offend, but I it needs to be said. Um, there's really no difference between a person who follows the devil and someone who pretends to be saved. <laughs> I'm going to let that marinate for a second, and I'll say it again. There's really no difference between a person that follows the devil and a person who pretends to be saved. And I say that because both of them are lost. If you don't know Christ, if you don't follow Christ, you're lost. He says, I know those who have the synagogue of Satan. Um, and the synagogue of Satan is a place of worship where God is not Lord. Jesus is not Lord. Uh, and if you're pretending to be saved, Jesus is not really your Lord. No. So there comes a time there has to, if you allow it, where truth has to prevail. Choose you this day. We have to decide as a church today, and the leaders of the church, um, are we going to be a compromising church? Or are we going to prevail? Are we going to hold on to the truth, even if it's not popular? Are we going to continue preaching holiness, uh, even though the world doesn't really want to hear it? Are we going to continue following the world instead of leading the world to Christ? Um, Jesus is simply encouraging this church. They're trying hard. They're continuing uh, and letting them know there's going to be a day of reward. And historically, we know for sure that these Turkish Muslims, and the rise of this uh, Muslim empire, uh, they found that holiness church and they killed everyone. Why? Because they would not let go of the name of Jesus Christ. They would not let go. They would not let go. I don't know why I keep saying it. Perhaps someone needs to hear it. Do not let go of the name. Revelation 3 and 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Trials, tribulations, temptations come to everybody. And it seems... Um, this congregation that's mentioned here, uh, they've been tested, they've been tried, and found to stand, even up to the point where, uh, because they wouldn't relinquish the name of Christ, they lost their life. Remember, Jesus himself was, was tempted 40 days and nights, but he came out victorious. And I say that to remind us that when trials come, we can do one of two things. We can stand against the temptation and experience victory, or we can take the easy way out and give in to the temptation and fall to defeats. So if we're really born again believers, if we are really uh, the children of God, um, if the temptation wins, If the temptation wins, what then? I'm, and here is where I'm lost for words. And I'm thinking of Samson, who gave in to the temptation. And even when the Philistines came, he said, I'm going to shake myself as I did other times and defeat this enemy. The temptation won. He's still conducting himself like he's, he has the power, only to find out that there's no more power. There's a whole lot of shaking going on, but where is the power? Where is the realness? This church uh, was real. They were the real deal. Nope, they weren't the largest church. Nope, they weren't a mega church. Nope, they couldn't brag. We got thousands and thousands of this and that, but the Lord said, you hold on to my name. I'm going to set before you an open door. And I'm going to keep you from tribulation. My God, that's powerful.
yourself. Um, I want to take you to Revelation 7. Um, because there's something there. He, he says, I'm going to keep you from temptation. I'm going to keep you from tribulation. And remember, um, when we know from reading Revelation and even in the book of Daniel, seven years, tribulation period, seven years. Seven years of tribulation at the end of the Gentile age or the end of the church age. The last three and a half years of this will actually uh, be the wrath of God. My God. I need to come back to this and even teach a series, perhaps on the tribulation period. God has promised the believers uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ that they will be saved from the wrath to come. And again, this refutes this idea that the church will have to go through tribulation period. Um, Revelation 7 and 9. Um, Revelation 7 and 9. After this I beheld in low a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now let's go to um, verse 13. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now these tales of people who were, for lack of a better phrase, saved or came out uh, of unbearable temptation at the end of this three and a half years tribulation now. The conversation needs to get deeper than this, um, and I don't have time to pull it, but re remind me, because I will come back to it. We will deal with tribulation period. Um, what did they have to give up, right? Because today all we, we're asked, yes, give up your life of sin, be baptized, repent. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and hold on to that salvation. Work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. All that is true. Uh, but do you really want to go through tribulation, period? Because if you can't make it under grace, I hear the word say, I hear you, Lord, say, then who shall be able to stand? How are you going to make it through all of this? Revelation 7 and 9, I beheld a, there was this multitude and no man, no man could number. People from all nations, kindreds and people, tongues are standing, right, and the elders are asking, what is this group of people? And the answer came in verse 14, 7 and 14. I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation. These are believers of Jesus Christ who have been brought out of great tribulation. Listen, these are those who gave their lives and refused to bow down to Satan during the tribulation period. They had to give up their lives. They wouldn't give up their sin during grace, but they had to give up their lives during tribulation period. Matthew 24, verses 21 through 22, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, nor ever shall be, and except those days be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Hmm. Matthew 24 and 21. For then shall be great tribulation. This is that hour of temptation. The Lord is speaking to them about in Revelation 3 and 10. And in Revelation 3 and 11, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast. Hallelujah. I come quickly. Hold fast that no man takes your crown. So that, that statement, uh, that verse verifies 
what we just finished talking about, that there is a test time for the believer and we'll be required to stand. And when we do, we will be raptured and saved from the horrors of the tribulation period. Now, I want to bring to light something because uh, the word quickly here uh, in this particular verse does not mean soon. Rather, it, it gives the picture of the idea of suddenly. He's coming suddenly, developing or stirring a, a feeling of expectation any moment now. It's going to happen suddenly. It's going to happen suddenly. Now, if I just if I just say soon, I say, oh, it could be one week, two weeks away. It could be 10 years. It could be 1,000 years from now. But if I say suddenly, and then I repeat what Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man shall come. He says, behold, I come quickly. Just like that. Behold, I come quickly. So he's giving me a picture uh, of something happening suddenly, stirring up a, a feeling of expectation. He can come right now, right? He says, I'm going to come at a time where you don't know. No man knows the day nor the hour. So uh, he's coming suddenly. I don't know when. He may come now. He might come tomorrow, but it's going to happen suddenly. This is, this is our hope. <laughs> this is our hope. I, I, I want you to remember that this is our hope. Our hope. Our hope. My, my hope is not uh, to be rich, you know, and I'd like to be, but the hope of my salvation the hope of my salvation is to make the rapture. Let's go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, where it says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he says, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast, which thou hast, and don't let anybody take your crown. Don't let anyone take your reward. And him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name hallelujah my new name thank you jesus uh brother vernon mcgee uh who is a theologian in his own right and a bible commentator um the new name he says and, and it's, it's not our new name but it's a new name god is going to write uh it's going to be our passport or visa that will enable us as citizens of, of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, to pass freely upon this earth or anywhere else in the universe. You know, we'll have glorified bodies. My God, and all you have to do is think about where you want to go and there you'll be. Uh, but he says this new name, he sees it as a passport or visa. We'll be able to travel the universe um, the name of this new name it's it's a paradox of course because he says i'll make you a pillar uh you you'll no more out uh, but with god's passport we can go everywhere now that's a bible lesson that one verse right there i could spend an hour on it uh a pillar uh, but you'll have freedom to to go wherever you want to go this new jerusalem Hallelujah. John said, I saw this new Jerusalem coming down. The new name is, is his name. And think of it not only as a, as a name, because, you know, we, we have a way of just thinking one way, but think of it as a new relationship we'll have with him. I shall behold his face. Hallelujah. It's going to be a new relationship. I'll be able to see him face to face. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. 
and to sing forever of the saving grace on the streets of glory. I'm going to lift my voice. Cares a pass home at last. Ever to rejoice. So uh, here we see there's something that we've got to overcome. <laughs> he that overcomes. A person many times is spoken of as a pillar in the community, a pillar uh, of the church, you know, we, certain people we consider being pillars of the church, and it just means that they're strong and then they're, they're upholding the church. But um, these people now, he said, now you have a little strength, but I'm going to make you a pillar. You have a little strength, but I'm going to make you a pillar. You've been faithful over a few things, but I'm going to make you rule over many. But here he says, you had a little strength, but I'm going to make you a pillar. So these people would be like founding fathers, high in principles. They would be the ones who would see to it that the church stays on solid ground. <laughs> yeah. So the writing of the name of God, um, look at it also as being sealed into his kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to read much more about this city, and I'm getting ready to wind up, we would find that sometimes it's spoken of as a bride. Uh, the believers of Christ are, are his bride. And the name of the city being on the believers, he said, you're also going to write the name of the city. It indicates that we are the bride of Christ. And the new name of Jesus that is written on us is showing that we belong to Jesus. We are his possession. We are his We've been bought with his blood. Hallelujah. And when he says you go no more out, it means that our eternal home is here with Jesus. Hallelujah. Nobody can put you out. You're home now. Hallelujah. Verse 12 is saying that we as believers have put our trust and faith in him and endured the hardship. And then we have an eternity of nothing but pure joy in this new Jerusalem with Jesus Christ. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So here again we're told, if you have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So here, um, he that has an ear, the Lord is reminding us and I'm getting ready to wrap up that he has the key of David, remember? And he opens the way to the kingdom of God. He also wants us to do his work and go through those open doors. I've opened the door. Don't just sit there and look. I've opened the door. Don't make any excuses. Go through the door. And he gives these opportunities to preach and to teach and to minister the good news of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's also encouraging us to persevere and remain faithful because you've kept my command to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial or the hour of temptation, from tribulation, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming quickly, suddenly. No man knows that I'm coming Hold on. You hold on until I come. You hold on until I come. Hallelujah. You hold on until I come. And don't let anybody take your crown. So here is what I've learned from it. And you can write these things down. Uh, here is what I learned from it. You have to consider three things in, in uh, reading and talking about the Philippian people, the Philippian congregation, you have to consider opportunity, opposition, and obligation. Opportunity, opposition, and obligation. And you have to ask the question, what kind of church does God prefer? You know, because we all have our likes and dislikes, and you know, with social media, you can go to five or ten churches now, and within the hour, and, and hit the one you want to sit in. Uh, but what kind of church does Jesus prefer? If Jesus was, was sitting with the remote control, what church would he stay with? What, what church would he, what church does Jesus prefer? Uh, because while we're studying outward things, 
while we're studying how big the church is and, and uh, the ambiance and, you know, how beautiful the building is and how many people are sitting there, one thing this pandemic has done, it has put everybody on an even keel. So the mega church is going through the same thing uh, that that uh, storefront church is going through, maybe on a larger scale. Uh, but what church does Jesus prefer? The one that's faithful to his word, the one that's holding on to the truth. What church does he approve of? Hallelujah. That, that church that is as truly in, uh, living and working in, in the love of Christ and of his word and of his mission. So here's where we consider the opportunity. Uh, verses Revelation 7 and 8. Um, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things. He that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door. That's the opportunity. That's the opportunity. So uh, two things about the opportunity. One, Jesus opens the door. Christ opens the door. And when God opens the door, no one can shut it. Yes. And the second thing there is that Jesus honors faith, not strength. He's not, he's not impressed with how big the choir is. He's, he's not impressed with how beautiful the robes are. He's not impressed with how much money you raised. He's not impressed. He is impressed with faith. And Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, I know that you have a little bit of strength, little strength, but great opportunity. Wow. May have been voted least likely to succeed, but he says, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Little strength and great opportunity, I found from reading the word of God, often goes hand in hand. Moses had a, had, a, had a stammering problem, and he pulls Moses and said, I want, you to, I want you to deliver my children, right? Little strength. He wasn't eloquent of speech, uh, so much so until he had to send Aaron with him, but he chose him. The opportunity is yours. Sometimes uh, small churches think there's, there's a, a little that they can do for the Lord, but it's really all a matter of perspective. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? The church in Philadelphia had a little bit of strength. We assume that they didn't have much money or a whole lot of influence either, but they had great faith. Great faith. Now, is Jesus saying, you kept my word and you have not denied my name? Opportunity. Consider the opportunity. Consider now the opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, Revelation 3, 9. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Consider the opposition. Consider the opposition and, and understand that we have an enemy that hates the truth. Satan hates gospel preaching and teaching. He hates it. Sometimes we hear people talk about uh, easy places to preach. I've heard, I've heard preachers say, oh, that, doc, that's a... That was an easy place to preach in. But really, to tell the truth, if you look at it, there's no such thing as an easy place to preach in. Yeah. Uh, as soon as a man decides he's going to stand for Jesus, he's going to preach the truth. As soon as you, young lady, decide that you're going to minister only the word of God, the enemy's going to fight you like I know what. I don't know what. I, I think the believers of Philadelphia cared enough about the truth uh, that they made some powerful enemies in the community. It's true. Now this, even to, to where this 
this Turkish or Muslim empire is, is being established and they would not deny the name of Jesus and they were killed. So uh, there are a few things as we consider the opposition. One, uh, I want you to know that we will be vindicated. Verse 9 proves that where he says, um, I know them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come to worship before thy feet. And, and the synagogue of Satan re referred to the Jews in Philadelphia who persecuted the, these, these apostolic folk. There were Jews in Philadelphia who persecuted these Holy Ghost filled people, right? Because Jesus, the name of Jesus, was threatening their way of life. They hated Jesus. And Jesus told us, they're going to hate you because of my name. They're going to despise you, but, uh, but I'm going to vindicate you. Number two, we will be protected. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. You won't go through tribulation, period. We shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I won't let you go through tribulation, period. I'll see you in the rapture. <laughs> Woo, my God. And sometimes all we can do is endure, but endure patiently. Hold on. Hold on. This, this war that we're having is not a bed of roses. This, this journey is not a bed of roses, but hold on on the last days we're in the last days and it's difficult uh to say the least and it may get even worse yeah uh, but with god we can make it through he that endures the same shall be saved so we considered the opportunity consider the opposition and consider the obligation consider the obligation Consider the obligation. Verse number 11, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. That's the obligation. Hold on to what you have and don't let anybody take your crown. So it's hard to read that verse really without getting a sense that the early church expected Jesus to come at any moment. We love to say he's coming soon, he's coming soon, but the early church was literally taught that Jesus might come at any moment, any second. So much so, and many of you have heard me say this before, because today and for many years when saints meet and greet, oh, praise the Lord. How are you? Praise the Lord. But the early church said Maranatha, Maranatha, when they greeted. So we were living back then uh, in, in the first through fourth centuries and, and maybe further beyond, and we met in the in the streets, Maranatha. If we met in the supermarket, Maranatha. We met by the riverside, Maranatha. And Maranatha means our Lord comes. They were constantly reminding each other that Jesus is coming. 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 So consider the obligation that we have. One, we are to wait for his return. <laughs> don't give up wait on them Jesus said I'm coming I'm coming soon how many of us believe that <laughs> we ought to live as though Jesus might come any moment now and work as though our time is short hurry up get in a hurry do what God told you to do he's coming any day now any moment now Maranatha and the second thing, we are to overcome by faith. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So the challenge to overcome is the one that we face every day. If we're going to be called overcomers, we're going to have to overcome every single day, every single day, because we do have a lot to overcome. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yes, let's be real. We have a lot to overcome. Temptations, frustrations, difficult situations, unexpected setbacks, money issues, family issues, health issues, internal discouragement, right? Some of us are dealing with chronic pain, personal failures. We have a lot to overcome. Hallelujah. But guess what? He that overcomes the same shall be saved. Endure. He that endures hardship as a good soldier, endure. You're going to make it. Hallelujah. You will be named and claimed by the Lord Jesus Christ. The power to name, listen, is the power of ownership. He said, I'm not going to let you go. No, I'm going to put my name on you. I'm going to make you a pillar. Hallelujah. In the temple. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to settle you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those who God has redeemed will be named and claimed by him. All the old names. Listen to my, my notes. All the old names. Doctor, lawyer, professor, politician. It won't matter anymore. <laughs> it won't matter what your name is, what your title is. Doctor, bishop, apostle. It won't matter. You know how many bishops and apostles and missionaries will miss the rapture if they haven't been holding on to the truth and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ? No. In that great day, the only thing that will matter is the blood of Jesus that washed away all the tags. My God, I feel like having church. <laughs> yes, the blood of Jesus has washed away all those tags. Our good names won't matter. Our bad names won't be remembered. My God. Our bad names won't matter. And the good names won't be remembered. I said that backwards. The good names won't matter. And the bad names won't be remembered. We'll all stand on the same ground. Saved, redeemed, renewed renamed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Hold on, be faithful. I hope you got something out of this lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop, but I feel like pushing further. I have been enjoying the word of God. There was so much meat in the book of Revelation. Don't be afraid to read it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Take the book, read it. Pray as you read. Ask the Lord to open up your understanding. The Lord is coming soon. And when judgment comes, it will first begin in the house of God. Here is our opportunity to hear the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. The letters that were written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Get it right. Straighten it out. Fix it. Put it out. Yes, because I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes, I'm coming. And I'm coming for my church. I don't want my church in tribulation period. Nope, that's not for us. The rapture is for us. And you, my friend, my sister, my brother, you want to be ready when he comes. He that overcomes. Hallelujah. He that overcomes. He that overcomes. Hallelujah. Are you an overcomer today? Are you an overcomer today? Then he says, he that has an ear. Are you listening to what Jesus is saying to the church today? What is he saying to you? Listen and obey. Father, we love you so much and we thank you for your word. We thank you, oh God, for what you've given us to share. I pray that someone's heart has been touched. Someone's heart has been strengthened. Someone has been encouraged. Continue, O oh God, to lay your hands upon us and help us, O oh God, to, to really adhere to the lessons that are being brought to us that we'll be ready when you come. Whatever's wrong will be made right. Whatever's dirty will be made clean, O oh God. Whatever's bound will be loosed. Help us, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we want to make it in. Everyone here under the sound of my voice, touch, Lord, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. I want to thank you for your patience on tonight. I hope I haven't kept you too long. 
If you'd like to plant a seed in this ministry, perhaps pay your tithes, you may do so. The technician will put that on the screen for you. And those of you at Refuge Temple Annex in the Bronx, you may use Give the Five. Father, bless every seed. Take every seed and bring forth harvest. Bless both gift and giver in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. We've got one more church to go. We're going to visit Laodicea next week. Don't miss it. Please don't miss it. Join me, won't you, as we close out this series on uh, the seven churches of Asia Minor, a letter from Jesus. Until then, three things I want you to do. I want you to be careful, be prayerful, and be holy. Shalom. Shalom.